Right. All right. Well, uh, thanks for coming um, at this late hour of the afternoon. Uh, my name is Armando Migliaccio. I'm here speaking uh, as a Neutron uh, PTL. And I'm handing over to either of you guys. <laughs> All right, we're going alphabetically. So my name's Christopher Price. Um, I've been working in the OPNV community. I've been a, a participant of the OpenStack community and, and Open Daylight um, for some years. Um, and here to talk about uh, OPNV networking and, uh, and the role of Neutron. Yep. Hi, everybody. I'm Rossella Splendido. I am a Neutron Core, and I recently joined the Technical Steering Committee of OPNV. Yeah, and I'm here to, you know, <laughs> give this talk about the relationship between the two of them. Thanks. Very good. So, more or less, where we're going to do this is three parts. I'm going to talk a little bit about a little bit about OPNV, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the features that are NFV related that are coming out through Neutron, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the history and futures and where Neutron's going, I guess, um, as a rough yeah. outline. Um, so I can start very briefly to talk about OPNV. I guess the first question is how many people actually know what OPNV does and where it is and, and, and those sorts of things? Because we have uh, maybe 20% of the room if we're lucky. Okay, so I will give a little brief introduction um, and I won't go too fast through it. Um, so OPNV has a few key goals. Uh, one and primarily is to develop a, a, a platform, an integrated platform for carrier networks, um, a virtualization layer, if you like, carrier networks. Uh, we don't want to build our own, which is why we come to communities like OpenStack that provide the real, the foundation parts for carriers and how they're going to build these networks. So, so we work a lot with other communities and, and we spend our time trying to help communities collaborate together uh, and find good solutions. Um, we also strive to participate, strive to include the participation of end users. So we have a number of, of key operators who are actually on our governing boards, AT&T, um, China Mobile, Telecom Italia, um, and others. Um, and we try and contribute. So if we have an idea, something we see as a need, we, we come to OpenStack and we say, hey, we need to solve this problem. Can we, can we do this together? And then we, of course, try and contribute to these communities, uh, Open Daylight, OPNV, uh, sorry, Open Daylight, OpenStack, uh, Linux, KVM, um, and trying to build, at the end of the day, an ecosystem for developing things. There's some statistics I won't go into because statistics are boring. Um, but just to give an overview of OPNFV then, we build a cloud, right? That's what we do. We build a cloud. We build it for telecom operators. So we try and look at what are the types of use cases that telecom operators have. They have big clouds in the middle. They have medium-sized clouds in, in different uh, cities. Then they may have smaller clouds at the edge. And all of these things are serving different purposes and require different capabilities. So we look at all of those clouds. Uh, in our latest release, Colorado, we produced 47 different types of cloud. Um, just because there are that many different needs that we haven't been able to converge them into a common platform yet. But, of course, the purpose will be to do that eventually. And we do this through integration primarily, uh, a lot of testing. Um, we do a lot of testing of things that have already been tested. This is just what we do. We, we bring all of the Tempest tests in, and then we write our own end-to-end -end tests. And we try and develop new features. Um, and one of the key areas for us is the continuous integration, continuous deployment pipeline. Uh, we work very closely with the OpenStack team on this. And what we're trying to do is make it as easy as possible to build a cloud. Um, we deploy, I think, over 10,000 clouds a year in our, in our uh, labs and infrastructure. And, and this is all based on this 57 or 47 different flavors that we have. Um, and that's all through um, aggressive automation, I would say. So what we do, this is a map which is kind of hard to read. Um, but at, at the framework level, we have the CICD pipeline. Um, that's all built around a set of infrastructures, components, um, hardware types, different lab configurations, and so on and so forth. And then on top of that, we build in our infrastructure and tooling, um, analytics, orchestration, virtual infrastructure management, uh, networking control, different types of networking approaches that we try out and we sort of integrate into these platforms. Uh, and then on top of it all, you have the application layer. You have things that you may want to run like platform as a service type um, execution environments. And all of this sort of sits over top uh, what we do as an infrastructure as a service layer. Um, as I mentioned, we did do a release recently, Colorado. Um, some key areas that came out in Colorado, we now have full IPv6 underlay overlay solutions in our, in our, in our uh, platforms. We've, we support uh, multiple types of service function chaining. We can do VPNs, BGP peering, end to end. Um, we have different hardware architectures. So we not only deploy an x86, we deploy to native ARM um, solutions. So of our scenarios, I think we have a dozen that have been ported to run both x86 and ARM. Um, because we see in smaller data centers at the edge of the network, we may have ARM-type architectures. 
Um, so supporting multiple hardware is extremely important for us. And of course, the DevOps in order to make this happen, um, extremely important. So we did a lot of work in that. And I think that's all I have as far as the introduction is concerned. And I will pass it over to Rizal. Thanks, Chris. Um, so now let's move on and see a little bit what's the relationship between Neutron and OPNFB. Um, of course, to, to understand that, first we need to understand what NFV is. I don't know how many of you in the audience are familiar with the concept. I'm sure you heard the word. I'm not sure you know exactly what that means. Uh, so the idea is very simple, is uh, to, to virtualize uh, physical appliances that are used by telcos to make sure that the traffic flows. So like radio equipment, router, firewalls, and you know, it's more or less what happened at the beginning of virtualization. Like we had lots of physical servers that were, you know, difficult to maintain, they were not scalable. So it's the same idea applied to network appliances. And uh, you can imagine the benefits, like you, you spare money, uh, you, they are easier to maintain, uh, it's easier to, to get orchestration. And so in order to do that, uh, we need a reference architecture. So I, I've taken it from, from Etsy. So let's try to understand uh, what are these uh, blocks. They, they can be a bit scary. Um, so that's why I slightly modified it uh, to make it a bit more human friendly. So um, we have the, the virtualized network function. So uh, this is basically the virtualization of a network function. What's a network function? Could be anything. Could be firewall link, uh, could be DHCP, you name it. And uh, this virtual network function, of course, they, they need an infrastructure. Um, so we need to configure and manage this infrastructure. This is done by the management and orchestration. Maybe you heard the word mano. So that's what it, that's what it does. So with, a, with a, <laughs> an analogy, like we can think of this management of orchestration level like some kind of god. And then this virtual network function, they are animals, plants, and yeah, human being. And the infrastructure being the Earth or any other planet you like where you can have life. I don't know if there are many. Um, so let's have a look now at the OPNFV architecture. You see, it's, it mirrors the, the diagram we've seen before, just with, with some more information, maybe. So they, um, they decided to use OpenStack as a Vim. It's a virtual interface manager. And you can see there, there are um, like three fields. Like there's the virtualization, the, the storage with Ceph, and then there's the networking. So guess where Neutron is? <laughs> it's, of course, the component that it's uh, taking care of, uh, of the networking. Uh, you can see that in the dia diagram. And um, as you can see, um, the, the most common configurations for OPNFV are to use uh, an SDN backend like uh, Open Daylight, Onos, or Open Country. So OPNFV um, and Neutron. Uh, Neutron provides the, the API that the VNF manager can use to create and configure this, uh, the network resources to be able to deliver the, the virtual network function. Um, of course, um, so the, there, there are two separate, so OPNFV and Neutron, they are a separated project and community. And uh, we, know we started developing Neutron before OPNFV uh, existed. So th there might be some friction, like it always happens in good relationship. Um, you, you, so I, you can have two kind of friction. Uh, one is um, tied to the, to the models. Like in Neutron, of course, we, we have abstraction. We have models to, um, to, to be able to identify some network resources like ports, networks, and so on. And uh, so these models might not fit completely um, into the PNFV use cases. Like, for example, uh, in Neutron, a network is tied to an L2 domain, and this doesn't work always well with, with, uh, with the OPNFV use cases. For example, it, it doesn't work very well with uh, BGP VPN. And then um, the, 
The other kind of, of friction that you can have is that maybe the, the API uh, is missing some piece. Maybe you, need, you want to extend it. And this is already happening. Uh, for example, uh, there's the networking S SFC project that it's uh, inside the Neutron Stadium. And what it basically does, it provides uh, the API to configure service function chaining. And we try to uh, collaborate and you know, one uh, good example of this collaboration is uh, VLAN Aware VMs, that it's a new feature that just landed in Newton. Uh, it was um, really wanted by the NFV people and um, it took quite some time to, to deliver it, but you know, we made it. And I, I just want to explain you a little bit what uh, this feature about. Uh, the idea is to be able to, to get uh, target traffic to the VM and also that, that the VM uh, should be able to send tag traffic. Uh, this is uh, very important for NFV because um, as I was saying before, the, the goal is to you know, virtualize um, appliances and you know, sometimes you might have a legacy application that uses uh, target traffic to um, make, ensure isolation and, and so you really need to get target traffic to the VM. And another like, good use case could be that you might need to uh, connect a VM to several networks. And you know, it's, um, it, it's not very scalable to create um, new interfaces, one interface for every network if you can use the VLAN sub interface. And then of course, uh, this feature is also useful for, for containers. Um, because you can then use um, VLAN to isolate the traffic inside the VM um, to be able to handle several containers. And to, for this feature, we added uh, two new entities. Uh, one is the trunk port. That, as the name says, this is uh, um, the concept of you know, a trunk, so it's a port that uh, can receive um, tag traffic. And then we have a sub port uh, that it's um, associated with a trunk and is identified by a segmentation ID. So the traffic that flows through the subport um, has only a specific VLAN ID. So I just wanted to um, quickly show you a little bit how it works in the OVS implementation. Uh, in, so here in the graph, we have a VM with a trunk port and a subport with a segmentation ID 10. Um, as you see, uh, to be able to handle this uh, target traffic, we introduced a new bridge, that is uh, the trunk bridge, that is uh, the one in charge of the yeah, target traffic. Um, so now let's, um, let's see what's the path of, of the packet when the VM is sending untagged traffic. So the untagged traffic will go through the trunk port. Uh, you see the, the square there, the, the, blank, the white uh, square. And uh, the, the trunk port, it's on network uh, two, so it's uh, the, the red line. So the packet will go to the trunk bridge. And on the trunk bridge, we have a patch port, TPT. And we have the pair of this patch port that it's on, on, the, on BRN, TPI. So the untagged traffic will flow through this uh, patch port and then to the pair, TPI. In TPI, I, I put the, the, the red circle because that's a tagged port. It's tagged with a segmentation ID 5 uh, because I assume that in this compute host, uh, 5 is uh, VLAN that it's used internally by the OBS agent to uh, separate the traffic between the networks. Uh, now let's see what happens when, when VM1 is send, sending traffic tagged with segmentation ID 10. So it will go through the subport, that it's uh, the, the blue diamond. Um, then it will get to, uh, to the trunk bridge. Uh, there we have this uh, patch port, uh, SPT, uh, that it's tagged with segmentation ID 10, so it will flow there. Then it will get to the pair, that it's SPI. As you, as you see, it's tagged, but with a different uh, tag. It's a triangle, so it's segmentation ID 7, because 7 is the a local VLAN ID that OVS agent uses uh, for network one. And I can hand it over to Armando now. Right. 
So I won't, I won't uh, go in a uh, in, you know, deep dive in, in VLAN over VMs, but what I will do <laughs> is to you know, double click on, on some of the things that Rosella and, and Chris have touched on when it comes to Neutron and OPNFV. And some of you may actually wonder what Neutron you know, is all about anyway. Uh, We've only seen this black box uh, without really drilling down into, into the internals. And I mean, to start off, uh, Neutron, besides a code base, as some of you may wonder, is primarily a, a community of people who are um, gathering around a, a virtual round table uh, called OpenStack and decide to collaborate and achieve consensus uh, the OpenStack way. And when the project was started, um, you know, the, the major objective of the project was to devise um, abstractions for any uh, networking uh, uh, constructs in a, you know, a self-provisioned manner. Um, and even though at the very beginning uh, one of the main tenant, tenets was providing you know, uh, overlay networking in, in, in the form of uh, a logical um, layer two uh, broadcast domain, um, the API and again the abstractions uh, underpinning it were designed, were devised in such a way that um, we could uh, strive to extend certain concepts, you know, alter certain concepts and uh, make sure that these concepts again uh, are to the best of our abilities technology agnostic so that they can map on top of physical implementations that may, they may vary. So um, that meant that the API uh, to some degree can be considered somewhat polymorphic and uh, um, any, uh, underneath, underneath the API, you can, you know, you can plug uh, different components. Uh, and I'm actually borrowing a picture. I couldn't even be bothered to change the name. Uh, Quantum is actually the former name of the, uh, Quantum is, uh, is, is, uh, is how Neutron was formerly known. Uh, we had to change the name for legal reasons. And uh, I'm borrowing this, this picture from, from a, an old slide deck, which exemplifies a little bit what I, you know, what I just described. And um, these compositions of services and, and components, it's something that we tend to refer to as stadium, uh, which is, again, this fancy name for just uh, describing a list of projects uh, that re are related to one another to deliver networking services on top of these you know, core backbone uh, that makes up like Neutron as a whole. And uh, uh, features and collaborations uh, end up being uh, managed and driven by what we call uh, Neutron drivers, which is a set of people who have been, you know, uh, have been around in the Neutron um, community uh, and, and project for uh, long enough to, uh, to be blamed for all the mistakes and all the good things that have happened in the project. Um, so uh, this, this picture somewhat exemplifies, you know, gives you a, a, a one view of what the Neutron architecture is like and what this modularization and this composition is like. Uh, the Neutron server, which is, again, one key component of the uh, Neutron deployment, is uh, what makes up uh, the part, you know, the bulk of, of, uh, of the system. And besides uh, things like, uh, you know, not things that are not that very sexy, like you know, state notifications, quota management, you know, policy enforcement, scheduling, and, and, and so on and so forth. The key piece here is the API abstraction, and the API abstraction uh, is uh, um, is where like where the magic is, and it, it is uh, fulfilled by what we call plugins. And uh, we have um, plugins that span from core plugins that implement what we call like a very subset. Uh, a, a core subset of, uh, of networking abstractions uh, that are used by other projects in OpenStack like Nova or Heat, um, Solometer, and so on. Uh, Magnum, uh, the, more, you know, the more you can come up with, uh, the, the better. And other um, services, they may consider like somewhat optional so, or uh, um, um, uh, appropriate or like uh, suitable for addressing uh, more niche needs, uh, things like uh, uh, load balancing or firewall and so on. Um, and all these components, again, can collaborate together in a loosely coupled fashion in order to deliver networking services. Um, the fact that this, uh, this is a very composable architecture means that 
two deploy neutron deployments may not necessarily look alike. So you may have like a cloud that is meant to do something like AWS EC2 that uh, is powered by a neutron deployment uh, that had just you know a core plugin and an L3 and L3 plugin, uh, and you can have another cloud that may be using a telco environment that's being configured to do something completely different that's very you know very uh, um, you know telco driven, where you may have like something like BGP uh, VPN and uh, service function chaining, and as as I, I you know I have sort of like. Um, uh, briefly skipped over uh, these uh, plugins themselves can uh, provide do, do provide a, a pluggable framework for tapping in into uh, potentially um, like SDN controllers or uh, um, built-in uh, agents then then they, they map the logical API artifacts on top of like physical uh, um, uh, physical uh, constructs um, so obviously, you know, it would be naive to think that uh, the, the platform would be ready and, com you know, functionally complete from day one. Uh, there are gaps. Uh, um, that the, the project has grown organically over time, um, but and, and but obviously there are gaps, right? Uh, uh, there is only so many people who are involved at any given time in the project, and the project is still relatively young. Um, so the question um, sometimes that we get asked is. Uh, is this feature ready or uh, is this a gap that uh, exists? Uh, and I, I think that these questions are valid, but I think that the, 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 I think the, more, the more crucial question is, uh, are this gap, uh, um, can this gap like, be, be overcome? So is the platform and the project arranged in such a way that these gaps can be filled over time. So, uh, is is the platform uh, a like extensible or or, or like uh, modular enough that things can be composed in a way that. Uh, not only a single person, uh, well, m many persons can understand at once what they're dealing with, um, not giving again the knowledge of, a, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of the whole thing to a, like, to a, to a god type of person, and, and B is like, is the, is the project adopting a set of processes and procedures to uh, enable uh, collaboration at scale? Uh, and I mean, look, looking back at the various releases that we've gone through, and having been involved as core and BDL, I would think that w w uh, we've established a set of procedures and architectural guidelines where things, uh, again, this, this uh, gap filling exercise uh, is somewhat of a, a success. Obviously, you know, we make, some, we make mistakes and, um, and we look back and try to iterate on our, on our mistakes and fix them. Um, and the reason why I bring this up is because I want to touch base on uh, something known as, as net rate in the OPNFV uh, um, project, uh, which, as far as I understand, and obviously Chris, keep me honest here, is, is a project aimed at identifying, again, what are the gaps that Neutron as a platform uh, has uh, when it comes to fulfilling OPNFV requirements. And you can find like the, the, the whole uh, set of uh, requirements and gap uh, identified uh, and uh, the link at the, you know, at the very bottom of the slide deck. And here I've uh, sort of like summarized uh, uh, in this bullet list a number of them. And the one you know, marked with, with crosses are the ones that I somewhat disagree with. And the one with the dixes are the ones that I acknowledge you know, is something that the neutron community has to work on. Uh, and I would be you know, happy to, to like, uh, um, you know, uh, drill down into, into those. Maybe we can do that in a, like, in a question and answer type of fashion. I, I have no more uh, slides. And again, I, I open up to, to questions. A round of applause? No? Yeah, thank you. That's fine. <laughs> so I think just to, just to paraphrase, I mean, so, so what, what Neutron provides, and I think coming back to the point of this topic, Neutron provides us with a, with a networking control function that allows us to move natively from OpenStack uh, into the network and start to manage that network. Uh, we see that, that, for instance, we've done studies in, in OPNFV which show that Neutron doesn't necessarily solve every problem in the world. Um, that's kind of okay. Neutron doesn't need to solve every problem in the world. I think there are, there are other architectures, other approaches. We know there's a bunch of SDN controllers out there that, that want to be able to and do integrate today. Um, and 
as we move forward, we explore how to solve some of these problems, some which are relevant to the neutron community, some which may not be relevant to the neutron community, and we try and find ways of you know, establishing how we can realize these moving forwards and, and, and essentially coming to an understanding of, of how to make progress as a community. Uh, and I think from an OPNFV perspective, we see Neutron as, as a very stable and constantly improving network and control function. Um, and for us, as you saw on the slides, it's one of many that we work with. Uh, so I think it, it just, it's part of the ecosystem. It's from an OpenStack perspective, the, 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 the primary net Neutron networking focused ecosystem that we want to work with. Um, and certainly want to find ways of making sure that we can integrate those other solutions and those other architectures into an OpenStack platform. But, yeah. yeah. And you know, I would like to add also that you know, Neutron, as I, as I mentioned earlier, is, again, is a community, is a system that you can deploy and play with and uh, uh, um, blame or uh, you know, uh, hate or uh, love, but it is also uh, the mean, the, the, the vehicle to uh, getting access to like, your workloads. Uh, ultimately, you know, OpenStack is, is about like VMs, containers, bare metals, you know, things that can crunch, uh, can crunch data. And if you think about Nova, you think about Ironic, uh, uh, Neutron is the element, you know, is the key of the puzzle that is used by these projects in order to provide networking services. So again, it's that interface that, get, that allows workloads to uh, get access to the pipes. Um, so that, that is also another, another thing that I would like to, again, uh, stress uh, and, and uh, highlight. Um, and you know it is important to realize that, as, as Chris mentioned, um, we don't necessarily have to bloat the the, the plumbing layer. Uh, we can we can figure out ways to carve it out, you know, slice it in such a way that it doesn't doesn't fall under its own weight. Uh, but that has to be done in coordination and cooperations with the entire OpenStack ecosystem, you know, uh, uh, you know, pro ecosystem of projects, uh, not just like looking and, and dealing with Neutron alone. So, for instance, there have been initiatives that uh, some of you may be familiar with, like 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 Blue One, uh, that tend to look at how you know Nova and Neutron uh, interface to one another, and in order to address certain um, um, issues with that, we will have to uh, look at both projects in conjunction. Yeah. Yes. yes. If you can go to the mic, I mean, that yeah. would be great. Exactly. Otherwise, you can uh, speak very loudly and we we'll try to replay the question. Thank you. OK. So given that there are gaps in uh, Neutron that you mentioned, and, and Neutron has plugins to various SDN controllers, does it make sense? I guess, when does it make sense to fill in the gaps in Neutron versus in the SDN controller themselves? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you end up, uh, there is no hard and fast rule, really. Uh, you make a judgment uh, call on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and ultimately, you see um, this question addressed by, by, by the needs of the persons and you know, the, the, the people in, involved in, in, certain, in certain initiatives. We tend to privilege uh, access to open source technologies as far as Neutron goes. So, so long as uh, there are technologies that we gain access to in terms of, uh, you know, SDN controllers or, uh, um, again, we can, uh, we can consider open and accessible, uh, then so long as we realize that we agree on a, on a common abstraction that can be easily implemented and mapped onto different implementations, you can go and, and uh, um, chase like an SDN uh, controller based uh, implementation first and then you can go and tap into other, uh, in other possible venues. Maybe you can go into like uh, uh, in a proprietary SDN controller venue, uh, like a path or you can take a, a path where you end up like building the entire stack yourself like for instance we've done for some of the services uh, and some of the plugins. So again it's somewhat like the answer is uh, it varies. Uh, um, and I've seen examples in the past where we chose one or the other, depending on how fast you want to get to, like, to market, so to speak. Yeah. I, I mean, just, just to add on to that, I, I don't think you, we can give an answer. It's, it's not that easy. Can I, can I fit ICN into Neutron? Um, that's something I probably wouldn't try and do, because that's just going to cause more problem than it's worth. 
So I'd find another way, and I'd find a way of integrating that into the solution if I wanted an ICN-based uh, data center. That, that's, you know, there's, there's, I think it's practical. We, we have to think about how to do things. Neutron is, Neutron is an attractive venue to get work done where it fits in to what Neutron is doing because Neutron is native to OpenStack, right? It's, it's the place if you want everyone in OpenStack to be immediately accessible to a technology, it's a great place to get stuff done. Yeah. Uh, if, if you want to address things in a different way or take a completely different approach, then, then maybe there's other, other venues that are, that are worth doing that. Yeah, I'd also like to add, it depends a lot on, on the kind of, of gap. Like if, if the gap is you know, some, some new functionality that you want to add, then it might make sense to go to an SDN controller. But if the gap is in the, like, the model doesn't really fit well, then I think the right solution, you know, is to discuss with, with the Neutron community and to see, you know, what you can do and try to find a common point. It, you know, it doesn't really work, like, simply to, to skip this step and just to, to use some custom SDN solution. Yeah, I mean, for, and from a practical standpoint, you know, uh, um, Asking the question, can, can you do it in Neutron, uh, ultimately boils down to choosing whether you want to like, do Python and you want to expose a REST API that looks like, that looks like uh, the Neutron API and it bolts onto, uh, again, the, the layer, the API layer that uh, the Neutron server provides to the other OpenStack services. And you know, if you're uh, you know, uncomfortable with uh, neither of those options, you want to use a different language or you want to expose the REST API in a different way, then obviously that, uh, that effort cannot happen in the context of, of the Neutron as, you know, as, the, as, the, as the software system. But it, again, the Neutron community is still pretty inclusive and open to uh, addressing uh, any, any type of innovation required in order to address any needs. So that if someone else wants to come along and want to do that in Neutron, because they're nuts or because they really have no spare time on their ends, I mean, they have spare times on their ends, then, then by all means, it's an open source community. It means that anyone is welcome to step up and you know, roll up their sleeves and do work. Um, I mean, <laughs> it's a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work. But, um, so yeah. Good. Any other questions? Any hard questions? Well, it seems like we've uh, either done a good job or a terrible job. Well, thank you for joining uh, us. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs>